This is joint work with Corina Cortes, who is uh, the director of research in, at uh, Google uh, New York, and uh, Vitaly Kuznetsov, who is a PhD student of mine at uh, the Kurat Institute, and Umar Sayed, a researcher at uh, Google. The title says uh, Deep Boosting, but let me say right away that the topic of this talk <coughs> covers much more than uh, boosting, since it is based on um, a theory of model selection that I will try to touch upon uh, later in the talk. Um, let me say right away that uh, shortly after uh, we wrote a paper on deep boosting, we, so we realized that there is a much more interesting deep boosting, uh, but I don't want to disappoint you, so, let, so let's just be clear, the talk is not going to be about this, as interesting as it may be for your skin or anything else. Um, the title says boosting, so I am going to briefly make some comments about ensemble methods in machine learning. Ensemble methods are very general uh, techniques in machine learning that consist of combining several base classifiers to create more accurate ones. Some prominent members of uh, such techniques are boosting, uh, say by uh, Freund and Shapire, bagging of Leo Breiman, uh, stacking, Bayesian averaging, there are many other variants and different schemes. These techniques are often very effective in practice. In fact, if you look at all the machine learning benchmarks, the winning system is always one way or another based on an ensemble method. In fact, if you want a trick for winning in such benchmarks, just wait till, say, near the end. When everybody is done, then do an ensemble of their uh, algorithms. Additionally, these methods uh, benefit from um, very favorable learning guarantees. These learning guarantees are um, given for convex combinations. Let capital H be a family of base classifiers. That means simple classifiers, simple predictors. For example, it could be as simple as a uh, hypothesis or a predictor that says that if the word Viagra appears in an email message, then it is spam and otherwise it is not. Such simple classifiers could be threshold functions which often in the theory of ensemble methods are referred to as being boosting stumps. So if you have just a linear, uh, 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 the real line that corresponds to having a threshold theta and saying that anything beyond on, the, on one side is positive, anything on the other side is negative. Uh, more complex uh, base classifiers could be decision trees. Typically in ensemble methods, decision trees of some limited depth. Depth two, three, you won't go too far quite often. Ensemble combinations are obtained by taking the convex hull of such base classifiers. What that means is that it's a family of functions that can be written, as you see on the slide, as a sum of alpha t, h t, where the alpha t's are non-negative, and where they, uh, they sum to something less than one, okay? So, uh, I mentioned that uh, ensemble methods benefit often from a good theory. That theory is for um, convex combinations, and the most modern way of uh, talking about th that theory is to use the notion of Rademacher complexity. So, I'm uh, briefly going to give you a uh, some idea of what that notion of complexity corresponds to, starting with the notion of empirical Rademacher complexity. Suppose you have a family of functions capital G, and you have a sample of M points, Z1, Z2, Zm. And uh, give yourself little m, huh, this has the size of the sample, little m number of coins that are taking values plus one and minus one, 
and these coins are independent. These coins are often uh, referred to as Rademacher variables. So in other words, they're independent ra random variables that are taking the value plus one or minus one with equal probability. Then the empirical Rademacher complexity of that family of functions, capital G, that's the R hat sub S of capital G that you see, is the expectation of the supremum over G of 1 over M, the inner product of that vector of coin values, uh, the vector of noise, you could think, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma M, and the vector of values that the function, a function G that belongs to the class capital G, can take on those values Z1, Zm. To understand what this corresponds to, you can view the coins as just random noise that you are creating. And suppose that you're ran creating random noise and you're asking yourself, can I come up with a function little g that makes my vector of predictions very close to the vector of noise? Very close means that it's similar. That means its inner product is large, right? If every time you come up with a vector of, uh, you know, sigma 1, sigma m, I manage to come up from my very rich family with, with a function g such that the vector of predictions g of z1, g of zm is very similar to the noise, that means that my family of functions is very rich, okay? So that's why there is a supremum over g, because that's the, you know, the, the, the one, the function g that is going to make it as the, the most similar to the vector of noise. Okay, so to now speak about it a little bit in more simple terms, you can view that inner product divided by m as the correlation of the vector g of z1, the vector of predictions, with random noise. So, said differently, you can understand the empirical Hadamari complexity as uh, a way of measuring how much you can correlate with random noise. How much you can correlate with random noise is a measure of the richness of your hypothesis set. You could say, why do you speak about Hadamari complexity? I may have heard about other notions of complexity. Let's say the notion of VC dimension, which was invented by a uh, Russian, Vladimir Vapnik. Um, well, there are two reasons for that. One is that the Rademacher complexity actually helps us come up with finer and finer bounds nowadays in machine learning. The second is that actually every time that you are giving a bound in terms of the Rademacher complexity, it immediately implies one in terms of the VC dimension because the notion of Rademacher complexity can be upper bounded by a term in terms of the VC dimension, okay? Now, this is for a fixed sample Z1, Zm. That's why it's called an empirical Rademacher complexity. If you now take the average over all possible samples of size m, that is known as the Rademacher complexity of that family of uh, functions, and that's the expression that you see all the way at the bottom of the slide, okay? All right, so this was a little complex, but if you pass this hurdle in the talk, I think the rest is gonna be downhill, okay? And some of you may already have heard about this, so. So, have, being now that we are equipped with this notion of complexity, Rademacher complexity, I want to go back to the finest learning bound that is given for ensemble methods. That bound is by uh, Kolchinsky and Panchenko. No matter what I say, there are some Russians in the picture, by the way. <laughs> um, this learning bound says the following. It says that with high probability, uh, for any ensemble function f, that you can see is written as sum of alpha t h t, okay? And the alpha t's are not negative again, and they sum to something less than one. For any such ensemble function, the generalization error of that function, that means the error that it makes, the error of that function, that's R of F, 
the left-hand side, is upper bounded by its empirical margin loss, a term that I'm going to explain in a second, plus 1 over rho, the Radamari complexity of the family of functions, capital H, those base classifiers that we just talked about. Okay, so quickly speaking, the uh, empirical margin uh, loss, the first term on the right-hand side, right, or hat S rho, uh, think of it as the fraction of the points in your sample that have margin at most rho, as indicated uh, at the bottom of the slide. That means that it's the fraction of the points in the sample that either the function f is misclassifying or it is classifying them correctly, but the magnitude that it gives, its confidence, is less than rho. Okay? That's what the empirical margin loss is. All right. This learning guarantee is the finest learning guarantee for ensemble methods. What it teaches us is that generalization is going to depend, of course, on the, well, the empirical term, but otherwise it's going to depend on the complexity term. And that complexity term is the Radamara complexity of the family of base classifiers. What it suggests is that learning with the family of base classifiers that is too complex will be prone to overfitting. Uh, the bound, the right-hand side, would become uh, uninformative if the complexity term becomes very large. This leads us to one, uh, several questions. Can we use much richer base classifier sets, much deeper families of decision trees? Can we use base classifiers that are, in fact, complex functions, kernel-based uh, functions, neural networks? Richer families are going to be needed to tackle some difficult tasks that are you know, presenting themselves in uh, applications nowadays. But the generalization bound that I just showed you suggests that learning with such very rich hypothesis sets, base classifier sets, should not be possible. So how do we deal with that? There's another set of theoretical questions that come up, and those are related to the uh, algorithm that is known as Adaboost. Adaboost is probably the most prominent ensemble method in applications, at least. And it can be described in very simple terms as being coordinate descent applied to the objective function that I'm indicating here, which is an exponential function. It's the sum of the exponential of minus yi f of xi, where f is an ensemble uh, function. That means that it's, it, f can be written as the sum of alpha t h t. Okay? So it's as simple as this. Coordinate descent is a very standard technique. But surprisingly, so, so the best learning guarantee that Adaboost can uh, benefit from is the ensemble method that I showed you. But surprisingly, it has been shown that Adaboost, in fact, does not maximize the margin. Said differently, it is not benefiting from the uh, learning bound that I showed you as much as one could. On the other hand, there are some algorithms that have been developed for maximizing the margin, including the ArcGV algorithm of Leo Breiman. But in practice, we see that that algorithm, the one that is maximizing the margin, is actually not doing as well as at a boost. Why is this happening? And there are some very suspicions for that. One suspicion is that those algorithms that are trying to maximize the margin like ArcGV again, they're doing this at the price of using very complicated base classifiers. Another suspicion is that maybe the notion of margin that has been traditionally used in uh, learning theory is not the appropriate one, and one should take into account the distribution of the margins. 
So one question that comes up here as well is, can we shed any light on this uh, surprising phenomenon uh, that uh, AdaBoost is still doing better than ArcGV despite it is not maximizing the margin? So returning to the main question of this talk, the uh, one that we are interested in is, how can we design ensemble algorithms that can succeed even when using very deep, and that's the deep of the deep boosting, very deep decision trees, very uh, complex neural networks maybe, many complex, uh, very complex base classifier sets. Can we? And to do that, we would have to introduce new theory and uh, then try to build algorithms on that. I will uh, precisely uh, describe a theory, a new theory, that uh, in support of this, uh, you know, for, this, for tackling this question, as well as algorithms and experimental results, and a new theory of model selection that I think is the one that is behind all these um, algorithms and um, learning bounds. So let me start with a theory. Suppose you have a family of base classifiers, capital H. And suppose that it can be decomposed into a little p uh, hypothesis set, H1, H2, H3, Hp on the uh, left. And uh, you can think, for example, of k for Hk as being, say, the depth of the decision trees, the family of decision trees of depth k or you could think of it as being the degree of the polynomial that defines the decision surfaces. Uh, a capital HK would be the family of po uh, polynomial decision surfaces of degree K. Or any other way of parameterizing the hypothesis set with K. Uh, equivalently, you can decompose the set into, in terms of the union of these sets. Now, consider now an ensemble function, little f, that belongs to the set capital F, the convex hull of the hypothesis sets that I described before. Little f can be written as a sum of alpha t h t by definition, with again, alpha t is not negative and summing to less than one. Now, if you look at one of these hypotheses, h sub t, it, by definition, again, it belongs to one of those subfamilies, capital H Ks. If we systematically choose HT out of the most complex hypothesis set, say HP, then the first learning bound that I showed you would suggest that we would be prone to overfitting. But what about now if instead we were using HT in more from more complex hypothesis sets in a more parsimonious fashion, less frequently? And if instead we were picking them from uh, simpler hypothesis sets more frequently? Did I say this, this more frequently from uh, simpler ones, less frequently from complicated ones? Would, would it be possible to learn in that case? And um, that is, in fact, uh, the main idea behind the theory that I'm going to describe. It consists of drawing hypotheses from HKs with larger Ks, but to allocate, to do this less frequently, or if you like, in terms of the weights alpha T, to allocate less mixture weight to complex hypothesis sets than to simpler ones. But how can we determine quantitatively how much we should allocate to complex hypothesis sets and how much to simpler ones? Can we provide actual learning guarantees for whatever uh, method we use to do that? Well, it turns out that there is, in fact, a learning guarantee that will serve as a guide to precisely do so. And uh, syntactically, the learning guarantee bound that I'm showing you is very similar to what I showed you earlier on. It is also still holding here for 
ensemble uh, convex combinations, functions f that you can write as a sum of alpha tht. It's the same functions. It is the same generalization error that it is bounding, r of f. The first term is also the same empirical margin loss on the right-hand side. It's the fraction of the points in the sample that have margin at most row. But the second term is remarkable. The second term is explicitly given in terms of the mixture weights alpha t that are used in the definition of the function f. They are, uh, if you view them as summing to one, giving you a uh, aver weighted average of the Rademacher complexities of the base classifier sets. It's an average, right? So it suggests that, in fact, there would be a way, if you choose the alpha t's, in a way such that you give less weight to complex ones, more to the simpler ones, to have an average complexity that is much better than what you would have had had you given a standard analysis, which, instead of the average complexity, would have given you the maximal complexity, okay? The complexity of the, uh, uh, the, the most complex set, capital HB. So this analysis is much more optimistic but not only is it more optimistic, it is, first of all, a finer analysis, a standard learning technique, if you're familiar with the techniques for deriving uh, bounds for high high complexity, would never allow you to reach this bound. The reason for that is that if you remember that supremum in the definition of the high high complexity, that supremum would also exist here, and that supremum would also be in this, over the set of alphas that you use. Therefore, um, because there would be that supremum, there is no way that you would have had the actual alpha t's that depend on the definition of f appearing in the bound. This bound is always finer than that, than, uh, that analysis. Again, the, the uh, explicit dependency on the alpha t's is remarkable, and that is what's going to help us to um, uh, give an algorithm, because uh, this explicit dependency on the weights alpha t is going to help us give a quantitative guide for deriving uh, an algorithm for assigning, you know, for deciding how much weight we want to assign to each subfamily. And this set of learning bounds, as usual in, in uh, machine learning, can be used in two ways. One way is to use it to inspire an algorithm. So an algorithm that sort of says that, uh, you know, uh, how much you should be sometimes going to the, uh, starting maybe with simpler hypothesis sets, then, it's, then going to the uh, more complex ones in some ways. Or it can be used directly to derive a learning algorithm. We have done both, but in what follows, I'm going to describe to you an algorithm that is directly inspired by this uh, learning theory. So, um, let me start talking about the algorithms. To describe the algorithm, I'm going to first uh, say a few words about the setup. So, as I explained before, I am considering P hypothesis sets, H1, H2, HP, that are disjoint subfamilies of functions that are taking values in plus, minus one, plus one. Okay? I'm additionally going to assume that this, uh, each of these uh, hypothesis sets is symmetric. In other words, whenever you have the function h in one of them, you also have minus h. This is really not a strong assumption since it holds, it holds for any uh, one of the base classifier sets that I'm aware of, threshold functions, decision trees, uh, linear functions. But let me say, it is really not necessary to make this assumption. I'm only making it here to simplify the presentation. Okay, so don't view that as a necessity. Additionally, let me uh, use a, a simple notation here, which is R sub J, which simply denotes the complexity, the Rademacher complexity of the hypothesis set that contains the function H, HJ. RJ, 
complexity of the hypothesis set co contains Hj. Now, in view of the learning bound that I showed you, we should be choosing the mixture weights alpha t that define an ensemble in a way such that we minimize the sum of the two terms that depend on alpha. The first term, remember, was the empirical margin loss. The second term is that sum of alpha t Radamari complexities, which now I'm writing as sum of alpha t rt. Okay. Now, the first term uh, is based on an indicator function, the indicator function of whether or not sum of alpha THT is less than rho. And uh, it typically leads to optimization uh, problems that are hard. So as it is done uh, standardly in machine learning, we are going to instead upper bound it with a convex surrogate. Okay? So suppose that you have a function capital phi, that is uh, such that the function that maps u to phi of minus u, to have just an example, think of phi as being the exponential function, such that uh, this function uh, u mapped to phi of minus u is a decreasing convex function that is upper bounding the standard zero one loss. Okay? So that's just used to upper bound the first term that I showed you before. Two Principal choices for the function capital Phi are the exponential function, which would lead to objective, objective functions of the style of uh, Adaboost, or the logistic loss, which is the log in base 2 of 1 plus exponential of minus u, and that leads to a familiar uh, algorithms such as logistic regression. So, but much of the theory that I'm describing here holds for any function phi of this type that you could choose. And the algorithms as well. So, if you do that, and if you uh, move the constraints to the objective, this turns into the following optimization problem. It consists of minimizing 1 over m, the phi of 1 minus yi sum of alpha j h j of xi, and uh, here <coughs> I'm uh, denoting by hj an arbitrary function in the uh, hypothesis set, the union of all these hypotheses, plus sum of lambda rj plus beta, the absolute value of fj, alpha, uh, I'm sorry, alpha j. So rem re remember that r sub j is that Radamacher complexity that corresponds to uh, the hypothesis set containing Hj. And uh, lambda and beta are non-negative hyperparameters here. So if you want to think of it in a different way, the last term, you can view it as a sum of beta times a sum of alpha j, which would be a standard norm one regularization, plus an average, a lambda times the sum of rj, uh, absolute value of alpha rj, which is an average uh, of the Hadamard complexities, okay? So this is the uh, objective function that is directly coming from the learning bound. The algorithm that I'm uh, describing, yes? Yes. That's a, that's a good question. So, so that's why I said when you move the constraints to the objective, you see that that beta sum of the alpha j's, that is exactly the... So, in, so if, I were not, if I were writing it with a constraint optimization, I would be writing that the sum of uh, uh, absolute value of alpha j's should be upper bounded by some, say, capital lambda. Imagine that now I, in fact, uh, less than one over rho it should be. If I now introduce a, a Lagrange variable, beta, associated to that constraint, I can equivalently write it like this. Now, why can I use beta in the way that I want, in a free fashion? Because I could choose rho in one over rho, also in a free fashion. Okay? So that's why. 
Right? It's a good question. By the way, before you also ask your question, let me encourage you to ask questions. Uh, this is a uh, uh, you know, closed audience. Feel free to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, yes, thank you, Pavel. That uh, the last sum is not a sum from t equal one; it's from j equal one. Thank you. Um, any other question? Okay. So the algorithm that I'm going to describe, deep boosting, consists of precisely using this objective function and of applying coordinate descent to this objective function. But to apply coordinate descent, I have to be a little bit more specific because usually coordinate descent is defined for a differentiable function. Here, the function that I showed you is not differentiable. Why? Because there was an absolute value there. But that's a very simple uh, uh, case of non-differentiability. So I'm just going to explicitly indicate what I do whenever I am in a non-differentiable case. And there are three cases which are shown on the slide. Um, if you're in the left-hand side, you would want to choose the best direction. So you want to take the slope, the right-hand uh, slide slope. Okay. If you're in the middle, you're already at the minimum. So you don't want to do anything. And if you're on the right-hand side, you again want to choose the uh, left-hand side slope to go faster down. So that's going to be my definition of coordinate descent because usually uh, for algorithms such as Adaboost you would want to pick the best direction and then for that direction you want to find out what, what the step is. Here I have to uh, explicitly say what my direction would be. Okay. Having said that, uh, here is the uh, some of uh, the more and indications about the direction and the step. Um, the direction is going to be based on an error, epsilon tj. That's the error at time t of the hypothesis hj. And I'm only showing it to you here in case you're familiar with algorithms such as Adaboost to show you that it's the same sort of uh, quantities that show up. And the same was in the case of Araboost, you can come up with a distribution d sub t on every round. And uh, we have also given closed form expressions for the step. Uh, we, as I said, it's coordinate descent, so you have to choose the direction, then the step, for the exponential and the logistic uh, loss cases. For the general case, you can just do line search, which, by the way, is just as fast. Having said that, here is the algorithm. Here is the pseudocode. Okay? And uh, some of you might uh, already look at this and say, oh, that's it, I got it. Uh, the purpose is not to scare the, uh, the hell out of you. Uh, the purpose is actually, well, let's see. What is, in your view, the, re the reason why I'm showing this? Anybody? Very good, excellent. Have you heard my talk before? Or Excellent, very good. If you were in my class, you would be getting already a great grade for this. <laughs> very good. Yes, it's very simple. If you're a computer scientist, you're looking at this and you say, wow, piece of cake. I can just implement it in a, in a few minutes. Right? It's very simple. Two reasons why I'm showing this. The main reason is what you said. The second reason is if you pay attention at line 13, what the algorithm, at each round, the algorithm has to find a direction and a step. The step here is eta t. It seems strange. At, in some cases, the step that is going to be chosen by the algorithm is the negative sign of the step that has been taken up to now in some direction. Said differently, the algorithm is actually sometimes completely annihilating the step that you have taken in some direction. Said differently, the algorithm leads to sparse solutions. Every now and then, in fact, is zeroing out the weight that you had along some directions. Okay? 
it's not surprising that the algorithm would be sparse, because if you think about it, it is doing a regularization that is based on a norm one or a weighted norm one. Okay? Right. And the rest of the algorithm you have now learned by heart, or maybe some of you have already implemented, so... Um, let me now say a few words about the connections between this algorithm and previous work. In the particular case where you would choose lambda and beta to be zero, that means no regularization, and in the, the case where you would be using for phi the exponential uh, function, you would be finding exactly Adaboost. The algorithm exactly coincides with Adaboost. Similarly, if instead of phi, you use the logistic function, the algorithm exactly coincides with unregularized logistic regression, probably one of the oldest algorithms in machine learning and statistics. If lambda is zero now, but beta is not zero, in the case where you use the exponential function, the algorithm coincides with L1 regularized Adaboost, which is also an algorithm that has been studied in the past, in particular by uh, uh, Gunnar Ratch and uh, Manfred Warmoth. If you now use beta but don't use lambda, lambda is zero, and you use the logistic loss, this is L1 regularized logistic regression. Okay, so there are at least four algorithms that I can relate to what I'm talking about. Of course, for us, the most critical parameter is lambda, right? So, let me now say a few words about experiments, um, but uh, let me also remind you that after the experiments, I will say a few words, hopefully, if I have time, about model selection, which, again, I view as being the key thing behind all this. So, one of the crucial aspects of the algorithm that I have described so far is that the quantities that appear in the objective function, and perhaps I should have emphasized this more before, Rademacher complexity, they're actually data dependent. This is one of the reasons why they're giving you finer learning guarantees. They depend on the data. The complexity measure itself is First, look at the sample, then it's going to help you see how complex your family of functions is. So that's a very interesting aspect of the algorithm because you can actually de uh, benefit from that data dependency. So ideally, you could go ahead and try to estimate these random high complexities, which would then give you those terms R sub J that will be the finest terms that you could have. Alternatively, you could try to estimate these are upper bound these. So in the experiments that I'm going to describe, um, I'm actually going to consider the case where you would be upper bounding them. Uh, and you can upper bound these uh, Hadamai complexities in sort of straightforward ways. For example, if it's a family of kernel functions, you could upper bound them as you may have seen for linear functions with a, in a, uh, uh, with a kernel in terms of the square root of the trace of the kernel k sub k that is associated to that hypothesis set. Or if um, you want to further simp more, you know, bound them in terms of uh, more combinatorial terms, you could bound them in terms of the notion of growth function. If you've never heard of the notion of growth function, is yet another way of uh, measuring the complexity of a hypothesis set, but purely in a combinatorial way instead of taking advantage of any statistical information. Um, so, uh, I'm going to show you several uh, fa a series of experiments. The first series of experiments is for the so-called boosting stumps uh, that I mentioned early on. Remember, it's just the threshold functions, um, uh, which uh, just declare that something is positive to the right, negative to the left, or vice versa or with a sort of a little bit more complicated boosting sums, second degree boosting sums or decision tree of depth two, which now are uh, uh, doing this uh, classification in a little bit more complex way. And uh, on the slide, I'm showing you the growth functions upper bounds for the Hadamard complexities. These are not difficult to derive. If you have never seen something like this, it's a simple little exercise. Um, but you see that, uh, in a way, this, 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 the Hadamard complexity for the 
second degree bo boosting stumps is the upper bound is going to be a bit more complicated, complex, richer, and larger than the upper bound for the first one. Okay, and we're going to be using this to weight differently different hypotheses. Um, so for this first uh, series of experiments, the, it's a union of these uh, two set of stumps, the simple stumps and the second degree ones that we're going to be using, and the data sets are UCI uh, Irvine data sets, the same as those, and we did this on purpose, precisely the same as those that the paper of Risen and uh, Rob Shapira used to compare Adaboost to ArcGV. The idea being that we're going to favor Adaboost because these are, you know, they've written a paper about that one for those data sets. We've also now taken uh, other uh, data sets, the OCR data sets, again used by Raisin and Shapiro, and the MNIST data sets, two of them. And uh, for this particular example, the experiments are just with the exponential loss. And the comparison is both with, therefore, Adaboost and L1 regularized Adaboost. So I'm quickly going to show you the results. Uh, oh, that's actually not uh, so bad. Um, so uh, let's see. On the left hand side, the first column uh, of each table indicates the data sets. Uh, then immediately after that, you have the uh, performance of Adaboost when run only with uh, the H1, the simpler uh, base classifiers, or Adaboost run with H2 stumps. And then you see the performance of L1 regularized Adaboost, and then that of DBoost. Quickly speaking, in all of those uh, data sets, the performance of DBoost seems to be better than that of L1 Adaboost, by about actually the same difference than L1 Adaboost is better than just unregularized Adaboost. Okay? And this picture you're going to see several times, so I'm just uh, preparing you for that. Now, another series of experiments is with decision trees. Well, now each family H sub K is the family of decision trees of depth K. And you can see on the slide again that I'm giving an upper bound on the Hadamacher complexity. This is the one that we're going to be using. The family of base classifiers is the union of all the families H sub k of decision trees of depth k. And here the experiments are both with the exponential loss and the logistic loss. Therefore, we're going to be able to compare both with Adaboost and L1 Adaboost and logistic regression and its L1 regularized counterpart. So here are the experiments with first the exponential loss. So now we're comparing with Adaboost and L1 Adaboost. And the story is very similar. Um, very briefly speaking, Adaboost L1 is actually typically doing better than Adaboost, typically. And DBoost is typically doing by about the same amount better than Adaboost L1. I don't know, for example, let's look at the uh, second one, Ionosphere. Adaboost is doing, has a performance of 6.6% error. Um, Adaboost L1 is 6.5, and DBoosting is 5%, okay? And this kind of pictures you see over and over again, okay? This is for the exponential loss. Now if we use the logistic loss, we are now comparing with Logistic regression, same sort of uh, story. Again, the deboosting column typically gives you a better performance, but not, you see, for the first data set, the performance of uh, deboost is the same as that of L1 regularized uh, uh, logistic regression. But the story overall is the same otherwise. Typically, DBoost is better than L1 regularized logistic regression, and L1 regularized logistic regression is better than logistic regression. Okay. The experiments that I just showed you, by the way, these are all for small or relatively small data sets, but they have been now uh, reproduced and validated with much larger data sets. And not just by us. For example, there are people at, uh, I don't know, American Express who have been using uh, the, our algorithms for data sets of several million, and they have reported back to us they find the same sort of uh, results. It's not even data that we have access to. Okay? So this is the same sort of uh, things that we have seen over, over and over again. 
Now, everything that I said so far was for binary classification. The real world is sort of more complex, and it deals with multi-class classification. Um, I'm now going to tell you that everything that I said so far can actually be done in a similar way for the multi-class case. This is, in fact, the multi-class learning bound that will be the counterpart of the binary one that I showed you. Again, you can see that the second term, that's the essential one, is explicitly depending on the alpha t's. And again, the story here, the Hadamard complexity is going to be the Hadamard complexity of the family of functions that I'm showing in the bottom of the slide. Much of what I said before can be done in a similar fashion, in fact, in a richer way, because in a multi-class case, there are alternative objective functions, all of which we have analyzed, actually. And we have reported similar results for multi-class uh, deep boosting which I'm just going to show you uh, for the sake of saying that I've shown them to you, but if you want to see them more in detail, you really would have to look at the paper. But pretty much the same sort of stories hold. Again, you can compare them in the case of uh, the exponential loss. Here, what I'm showing you on the left-hand side is Adaboost MR, which is the algorithm that uh, uh, Shapira and Singer uh, proposed for um, as a multi-class generalization of uh, uh, Adaboost. L the L1 version of this is what you see in the middle column, and again, the multi-class deboosting, which seems to be outperforming both of these, is on the rightmost column. Same thing if you use now logistic regression, in which case, you are, since you're doing multi-class, this is multinomial logistic regression, and L1 regularized multinomial logistic regression, and again, the multi-class deboosting version of this. Same uh, uh, idea, same story, again, same sort of an improvement, and the improvements that I'm showing you here, I have actually not run the experiment myself, but I'm ready to guess that if in, in the, instead of using an upper bound, you were actually literally uh, estimating the complexity terms, you might get even a better uh, result. So, I, these ideas of uh, you know, making use of the different complexities of the subfamilies can actually be used in other contexts as well. In fact, we have generalized the same sort of ideas to the case of the maximum entropy models, which are vastly used in practice for density estimation. In particular, what, I, what you see on the picture, this is for uh, 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 habitat species modeling, and uh, species habitat mo modeling, which, uh, for which, again, that our algorithm, which we have been calling structural maxent, is outperforming the standard Maxent model or the standard L1 regularized Maxent model. Okay, so this is just I'm just showing you a picture with, uh, with some words, but the same sort of ideas. If you were to use Maxent, if you're familiar with that maximum entropy models, you might want to use a very rich family of uh, features. In fact, some people say come with as many features as you can, but now those features could have different complexities. Some features are simple, some are uh, more complex. The same sort of ideas can be used to go even further in what we have been calling deep cascades. These are very rich decision trees where at each node you might wish to choose a different question than just a simple threshold question, you know, is uh, xi less than theta or not? And with leaf questions that might also be more complex than the standard leaf questions that are simply like majority vote. So we have shown that the same ideas that consist of assigning different complexities to different ways of, uh, you know, the way you're choosing these node questions or leaf questions that I uh, indicated before for uh, deep boosting, the same sort of ideas can be used here to lead to a regularization that helps you learn such complex hypotheses and gain some improvement. Any question? Okay, so um, if there's no question, uh, I am going to 
briefly speak about uh, what I think is really the theory that is behind much of what I have described so far. This theory is a theory of model selection. So let me just say a few words about what model selection consists of. In some way, you could think of model selection as being the deepest thing in machine learning. What is the very first thing that you need to do, to do if you want to run an algorithm or if you want to decide on what algorithm to run? The very first thing to do is to choose a hypothesis set. That is model selection. How, to, how should you choose that hypothesis set? If you choose that hypothesis set, capital H, to be too complex, with the hope that, hey, I'm going to choose it so broadly that it is going to include the holy grail, the base classifier, typically you won't be able to give any generalization bound. Learning theory tells you that if you don't have a finite VC dimension, for example, or finite any one of the complexity measures that you want, you won't be able to generalize in such cases. On the other hand, if you choose the hypothesis set H to be too simple, you could give a generalization bound, definitely, but then you would be paying the price in terms of how far you are from the base classifier. The picture is exactly trying to convey that. On the one hand, you see the point there that is uh, indicated by H base. That's the holy grail, the base classifier. The distance from that uh, classifier to the family of hypothesis sets, it's typically referred to as being the approximation error. Within that hypothesis set, the distance between the hypothesis H that you pick and the very best that you could have picked, the best in class, the H star, that's typically referred to as the um, approximation error. So the error that you make can be decomposed into the sum of the two. If you see, you can see on the, on the picture, as simple as it is, that if you pick the hypothesis at H to be larger and larger, you would be clo closer and closer to the base classifier, and therefore your approximation error is smaller. But as you make the hypothesis set richer and richer, your guarantees for being close to the base, best in class would be weaker and weaker. How do we deal with that? This is at the heart of machine learning, model selection. One way to deal with that is to use what Vladimir Rapnik came up with, which is the idea of structural risk minimization. This is a beautiful idea. It consists of uh, saying that, suppose that I decompose the uh, family of hypothesis capital H. You can see already the relationship, right? I decompose capital H, into a family of here nested hypothesis sets. So hypothesis sets with growing complexity. And um, suppose now that I, instead of looking for um, just the best, you know, trying to find the best hypo uh, function in capital H, what I do is that I find the hypothesis for any fixed little k that has the smallest error smallest empirical error, the smallest error on the training set, plus some penalty term that is a penalty term that depends on k and the sample size. On the picture, you see what happens. As the uh, complexity of the hypothesis set grows, as k grows, your training error is going to go down. The penalty term is actually something that is of the form of square root, for example. So that is going to uh, go up. What structural risk minimization consists of doing is to minimize the sum of these two terms. So that's the red one that you see on the picture. But here's what it's trying to say. It is trying to identify the best hypothesis set, capital HK. The one that is the most favorable to you. That is what structural risk minimization is trying to do. It is going to then commit to that hypothesis set, capital HK. You're going to be getting the hypothesis with the smallest error in that hypothesis set. There's an alternative theory of model selection, 
And that is what I have been calling voted risk minimization. This theory consists of saying that you do not need to commit to a single hypothesis set, capital HK. Instead, make use of all of them. And consider ensembles that are of the form sum of alpha k hk with a hypothesis set, de hypothesis dependent penalty that is precisely the penalty that I showed you so far, the sum of alpha k, the high high complexities of hk. I won't have time here to get into the details of the learning bounds and learning guarantees. What I can tell you is that this theory of voted risk minimization actually leads to a finer model selection theory than that of structural risk minimization. Again, instead of committing to a single hypothesis set, you actually can make use of all of them. All right, so I'm going to, uh, and this leads to a very general notion of uh, deep ensembles, if you wish. I'm going to conclude here by saying that what I showed you, deep boosting, is an ensemble learning uh, algorithm that makes use of the complexity of different subfamilies. The analysis is data dependent, it's based on those Radamacher complexities. Um, the algorithm is directly derived from the learning uh, bounds and therefore from the theory. I briefly told you about an extension to the multi-class case. I mentioned other uh, uh, extensions to structural, um, to, I'm sorry, to maximum entropy models, to decision tree learning. We have not done this yet, but the same sort of extensions can be done for ranking, which you might be uh, interested in, and other loss functions. And as I uh, tried to indicate, um, this leads to the enhancement of many existing algorithms, including Adaboost, L1 regularized Adaboost, logistic regression, L1 logistic regression, and the multi-class versions of these, and um, other variants. Okay, that's about it. Thank you very much. So if I understood correctly, you derived some algorithm based on your theorem about the upper bound for uh, the error, the expected error. So uh, if we would obtain some better upper bound for this error, we would uh, we probably derive some better algorithm. So uh, could you make a guess what would be a better bound or not? Okay. So just very a guess. Good. So basically you're asking what would be the next you know, step uh, there. It is, it is often uh, very hard to prove a theorem, but it's not so uh, as hard to, to make a guess. So, so it's a very good question that you're asking. What would be the next step and what could I do that would be even better, say, than what we have been uh, saying so far? So in some respect, I would want to say that you might not be able to do much better than what I just described. And I'm going to try to say why. You won't be able to do much more in terms of the dependency on the alphas, on the alpha sub j's. Because, well, you would probably agree with me that you need the dependency on the alpha j's. The second thing, if you're sort of reasonable, you would want to say, well, it would have to depend on the complexities of each one of those hypothesis sets. What kind of other mixtures intuitively would you think about than the one that I just showed? Okay, I'm just trying to work it out with your help. That being said, there is a second, uh, there is an alternative term that you might be thinking of that would be sort of like second order terms, like sort of taking into account the standard deviations. So it is possible that if you use even more complex analysis of that kind, taking into account the second order terms, you would indeed definitely get to uh, obtain a better bound, finer bound, which could be beneficial depending on the, va the, sta the, the magnitude of the standard deviations. Okay, if, the, if, the, if you're in the large case, you might not. If you're in a small one, you might. And overall, you might be able. You would have also another term, which means another uh, hyperparameter. But yeah, so if you're interested in uh, doing this, I'm almost certain that uh, it's possible. But uh, yeah, it requires some uh, work, but... Uh... Any, any more questions?
Thank you for your lecture. Thank um, you. I have a stupid question, perhaps. How do you empirically choose the lambda, which is crucial? So it's, it's a natural question. Uh, the, both lambda and beta are chosen by a cross-validation. So that's the standard uh, technique. Uh, by the way, since I talked about model selection at a very high level of uh, theory, uh, you could then start asking yourself, is model selection a good thing to do? And my answers there, if you're interested, is that model selection can also be compared to structural risk minimization. And you could sort of sh show that under some regimes, structural risk minimization and model selection are very, very close. So therefore, you would be benefiting from it. But since I also just told you that voted risk minimization could be even better than, than that, you could start thinking that maybe there's something better than even cross validation in that way, using voted risk minimization ideas. But I'm just reading more into your question than perhaps what you asked. OK. Other questions? Yes. yes. In the beginning, you said uh, something about uh, other approaches to um, ensembling, like Bayesian model uh, averaging. I have no idea what it is, but I suspect that uh, you can do uh, something like this. Uh, I mean, we combining classifiers with different ways depending on their complexity in Bayesian framework, where you uh, uh, average predictions of different models with weights proportional to their complexity. Yes. I guess this is what you can call Bayesian model averaging. So uh, it's kind of similar, but in Bayesian framework, how do you compare your methods with uh, something I described? So you almost asked two questions, at least two questions uh, at the same time. I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to uh, you know, analyze them and separate them to answer them. So one first question is, what is the connection between... So, First question is, can we do the same sort of things in Bayesian averaging? I'm first going to separate those two questions. So the answer is yes. <laughs> you could do the same in the Bayesian case at least, uh, in the same way. And I'm not a big fan of uh, Bayesian uh, models or Bayesian analysis. I'm not actually, I'm not against it, but I'm only not a big fan in the sense that I, this is not the way I do things. But uh, in the end, quite often, the math is the same. So I'm not taking any fight along those directions. The second question that you were asking is, is actually Bayesian averaging any different from what I uh, described here? And that answer is, yes, it is completely different. The reason is, in the Bayesian averaging case, the, the distribution that you want to take over the family of families of functions is a distribution over, well, I guess it depends also on, on what you mean, but typically there the distribution would be over the base classifier sets. Here are the alphas that I'm talking about. Huh? The alphas are the mixture weights themselves. The choice of those mixture weights is guided by the complexity of the hypothesis sets. Okay? So I think that there is a difference between the two. And it is possible then that, that um, you, know, you would be making uh, more connections between the two uh, different analyses. One reason for that is, uh, being that quite often a Bayesian analysis, uh, you know, there's always a Bayesian analysis of uh, the non, the frequentist analysis. Um, but, but at least in a straightforward manner, I don't see it. So I think that it would require more effort. There, there is probably a connection, but I don't see it as being straightforward. OK, thank you. Sure. Yep. So, uh, I might have missed a very simple thing, but uh, who decides uh, which HK to decide, uh, which HK to select the base classifier from on each iteration? Like is it an input to the algorithm, or is it a part of algorithm to decide which of the subdivisions? When you say that each HK, so the, the decomposition is given to the algorithm at the beginning. The decomposition of capital H into H1, H2, HK, HP. That decomposition is given. An example being, for example, if you were taking a family of decision trees, you would have decision trees of depth 1, depth 2, etc., etc. But that's it. 
what the algorithm is left to do is to decide at each round which hypothesis out of which hypothesis set to pick and with what weight. That is entirely decided by the algorithm. Okay? So, so that is actually the essence of the algorithm. And that is where choosing from different hypothesis sets, simply speaking, is penalized depending on the complexity of that hypothesis set. So naturally speaking, if you want, here's another view of this algorithm, the, the algorithm that I, that I described. You can think of it as actually doing structural risk minimization at every round. Because as, as at every round of the algorithm, it is trying to uh, uh, weight differently different hypothesis sets and pick a trade-off of the empirical error of the best hypothesis in, in each one of them plus, plus a penalty. Empirical error plus a penalty, that's exactly what structural risk minimization consists of doing. But it's doing this at every round. So that's another view of it, okay? Other questions? Yes. Thank you a lot for an interesting talk. I want to ask if there are any other ways of uh, defining complexity and could uh, algorithm like be, I don't know, improved or up on boundary be improved by choice of different complexity? Potentially, yes. So uh, here you're asking a very broad question, uh, which is always a fundamental question in learning theory. You know, can you do better than the notion of complexity that you have been working on uh, up to now? And yes, if you can, and so already the one that I mentioned to you, high complexity, which is now broadly used, has this wonderful feature that is, it is data dependent. It is actually depending on a sample that you draw. So that aspect, you really, I think, would want to keep. Can you now come up with a complexity measure that is finer than uh, the notion of high complexity? Perhaps. Um, but um, I don't have any suggestion there. I would guess that if you do, you could come up with a better analysis and better algorithm. That being said, you would also need to really estimate it finally, right? So yes, you have these two challenges, but otherwise my answer is yes, you could. Let me add that there are other data-dependent complexity measures like, for example, even for the notion of VC dimension, you could talk about VC entropy and make the, you know, consider the data dependent version of all these notions. All of these are completely legitimate ways of doing things. It just so happens that uh, the notion of Radamari complexity has uh, been uh, very useful for the analysis. It's very easy to derive bounds. At least, you know, I've, I've been trying to show that this in my book by giving a series of examples. So that's one of the convenient aspects. Uh, can we do better than just taking the upper bound of the Rademacher complexity? Maybe we can uh, use some uh, empirical estimates or something else? I, so that's a very good question. I uh, have been asking this question uh, to my uh, students, those who have been running the experiments. Uh, my guess is yes, that if you actually do estimate them accurately, you should be doing perhaps slightly better. I'm guessing this because I believe in the theory. But that being said, it is possible that the gain would be very small. I actually don't know. It's, it, it, it has been since the beginning one of the questions that I've had for uh, those people who have helped me run experiments, and I'm curious about it, but I still don't know the answer. I would want to guess, so I can only say that it's a guess. Yes. It's, that being said, it is not always easy to estimate Rademacher complexity. Okay? For some of these things, the cases that I described, it's very easy. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, so as far as I get, uh, it, you basically introduce a new error function for all possible base algorithm. And uh, what I want uh, to know is when we speak of uh, cases where we have a lot of local minimums of this function and we want to find a global minimum, so how, do, how well does it behave? Because this function, this error function, as I see it just briefly, it's pretty complex. So does it uh, process well in such cases? Okay, so, uh, so first let me emphasize the fact that the objective function that I showed you here, it's a convex function. So it's purely convex optimization. There is no local minimum in this case here. Uh, what you might be thinking of is cases where you would wish to consider an upper bound capital phi that would not be convex in those cases. Because whenever it is convex, everything that I said here is going to apply and it would actually lead, particularly if it's strictly convex, there's only actually one optimal solution. What you're thinking of, I'm perhaps reading uh, in your mind, but is probably uh, the type of things that people do for neural networks. And if I extend your question, uh, you're thinking, can we do similar things for neural networks? Uh, and the answer is yes. In fact, very recently, I mean, this is like really, really recent work now, uh, we have uh, tried to apply the same sort of ideas to the case of learning neural networks. So to just say a few words about it and to say why it is relevant. One way to uh, uh, learn or uh, design uh, artificial neural networks is to decide beforehand on the number of uh, units on each layer, the number of layers, et cetera, et cetera. I said differently, to decide on the architecture. Suppose now that you don't decide on that. Suppose you let the sample decide for you. And suppose that you then think of the units at different layers as having different complexities. Do I need to say more? You can see what happens, right? As you go higher up, the functions that you obtain each corresponding to a unit, higher order unit, are going to be more and more complex. At each round, you might wish to ask yourself the question, should I create a unit that is at the you know, first layer, or should I go all the way at a higher unit, a higher uh, layer unit, and with one that would be more complex, a more complex function, but that would be paying off in the sense that its empirical error would be smaller. So, um, to go back to your original question, if the question is really about n learning neural networks, actually this leads to a convex optimization fashion uh, technique for learning neural networks, which we've been calling ADANets, because it's adaptively learning the neural nets. This is really work that has, we have started uh, very recently. The theory and algorithms are done, but we are actually about to do run experiments. And uh, my hope is that the same sort of improvements that I showed you here would hold in that case as well, without having to suffer from the non-convexity case, actually. And the uh, many local minima, exponentially many local minima that you would encounter in the case of neural networks. So, so I hope I answered your question and maybe the questions that you perhaps could have had. But, uh. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, the question is, uh, could you still uh, do better than typical algorithms if we omit the dependency on data in uh, in our realization term and just uh, use the idea like uh, shallow decision tree is simple model and uh, deep decision tree is complex model. So if we don't use uh, depends on data in our calculations, uh, can we still do better than uh, like uh, L1 regularized uh, at a boost? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. 
<laughs> that's very brief, very to the point, right? Um, yes, the answer is yes, and uh, partly because of some of the arguments that have been given before, but in view of the question that you asked, as for some other people, I could be reading in your mind some other questions that could come up if you tell me that you're interested in decision trees. And that's the kind of algorithms and ideas that I mentioned for sort of learning deep cascades. These sort of more complex hypothesis sets. And I'm not saying this for no reason, because actually I have seen in applications, uh, in fact, in applications in search engine contexts where you would wish to learn a classifier that has this hierarchical aspect to it that is a decision tree, but that is not a trivial decision tree in the sense that the question you want to ask in the middle is not a trivial one. And there are cases where this actually happens. Uh, for such cases, being able to benefit from this way of assigning uh, penalties for complex or versus non-complex hypothesis as is crucial. So, yeah. There's a lot to... There's a lot to do uh, in that respect, by the way, if you're interested uh, pushing the theory of decision trees uh, even along these directions, you know, what, how much more uh, complex hypothesis sets could be used or, um, you know, uh, how combining them could further improve uh, accuracy. I believe that a lot could be done there. And, and in fact, so much that you could compete with the best neural networks, actually. There. So, that's it. Guys, I think we've done very well. This yeah, yeah, yeah. Haven't you? <laughs> Thank you for the nice presentation. I, I would ask, uh, in the back to the previous question, in the context of, uh, well, applying these deep ideas to neural networks, is it is it is it easy to estimate or empirically estimate the Radmacher uh, university of adding? Um, well, additional layer nodes of the functions that appear there and so on. Yes, so to answer your question, uh, more generally, the question is how to come up with the, with the Hadamard complexity, actually, or the, an estimate of the Hadamard complexity of the family of functions defined at each layer. Am I uh, uh, repeating this correctly? Uh, and the answer is yes. In fact, it, so yes in the sense that, yes, it is not too difficult to do, and we have done it. Uh, but in a way, if you are familiar with some of the techniques, again, including those that I'm uh, describing in my textbook for upper bounding Hadamard complexity, um, then uh, you should be able to see that it is actually not too difficult. To just give you some ideas of why, right? When you're, each one of the units at layer K is connected to layer K minus one, after all, simply by a, uh, li in a linear way. So you can therefore use that uh, in the same way as you would be trying to measure the complexity of a family of linear functions. Uh, you can use that to uh, uh, connect the complexity of layer K to that of layer K minus one. And really the bounding techniques, the, the, the techniques from the mathematical point of view are very, very similar. So, in fact, it can be done, and it can be done actually fairly accurately. Yes. But it's a good question, because this is the first thing that you need to, to think about when you want to apply it to that. Any more? No. Well, I think you've done very well with the Q&A session. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.